Hi everyone and welcome back to my channel. In today's video we're going to be talking about leopard gecko cohabitation. If it looks like I'm slouching at all, I apologize. I am sitting in a chair with my back against the chair because I actually hurt my back a couple weeks back. You know, getting old is delightful. I have recorded a couple videos sitting upright like this, but my back is starting to hurt so I'm going to sit back a little bit and hope that that's okay with you. Also, don't worry, I'm okay. It's healing up fine. It just, I can feel it be stressed when I'm sat in one position for too long. So yeah, real fun getting old. I turned 28 this year. <laughs> delightful. In today's video, I'm going to be talking about leopard geckos and cohabitation, why I personally think it's dangerous, and if you're gonna do it, like, the ways I think you'll have the most success, but again, I don't recommend it. Let's just put that out there right at the front. And I also want to talk about some of the thoughts around keeping leopard geckos housed together as well. So before we get into that, I ask you to please like, subscribe, hit the notification bell, consider supporting us on Patreon or be by becoming a channel member. We'd love to have you. And with all that said, let's go ahead and get started in this kind of controversial video. <laughs> Or thing I want to say is that my channel is only one resource, like this should not be your one and done stop for learning about cohabitation of leopard geckos. While I do have a lot of experience and a lot of leopard geckos, I don't think that I should be the one and done or the one be all situation for you if you are researching about leopard geckos. So consider watching this whole video, thank you, I appreciate you, but also consider checking out other people's content or reading articles or care guides online as well. So with that said, let's go ahead and get started. I think that cohabiting leopard geckos is dangerous and I'm going to list all the reasons why. The first reason is that typically when you have two geckos or more housed together, one survives and the other one does not. And, or sometimes it'll be like one thrives and the other one is just barely surviving. Like there's always going to be one that does better. I shouldn't say always. In most cases, there's going to be one that does better and one that does poorly. I'll give you an example of this. So I have a gecko named Alisan. I'll put a picture of her on the screen. She's a very cute, but she actually was rehomed to me from a rescue situation that was not great. I mean, she had like missing toes and still does. She had a burn mark on her back and shed was stuck to it. And then the gecko that she was cohabbed with was extremely malnourished, covered in stuck shed, also had metabolic bone disease, could not move, like really just a really, really awful situation. And that gecko actually ended up needing to be euthanized, which is really sad. But unfortunately, that's just the way that it went. But that was Bean and Tula. Tula was Alisan now, formerly known as Tula. But that's one situation. I have another situation with Arya and Sansa, who both came to me cohabbed, and they both were malnourished, but on the opposite end, they were really overweight. And Sansa actually ended up passing away. So that's two situations in which there were two geckos housed together and one of them survived and one of them didn't. And then I also have a gecko named Elia who was rescued as being kept with another gecko. His name was, I think, Mr. Screamy. But Elia was sent to me after like six months of rehabilitation. But both geckos had severe metabolic bone disease. They were malnourished. They had stuck shed everywhere. I think one of them was worse than the other. I think Elia was worse than Mr. Screamy. Like, just by the look of her back, I'm pretty sure she was worse. But even so, not great. And it just happens to be the case, unfortunately. And you can see this, like, on Craigslist or people when they're reaching out for help online. When they have two geckos housed together, one does okay and one does really poorly. And unfortunately, that is because one animal will be getting all the resources. One animal will be getting all the heat. One animal will be getting all the food and therefore all the supplementation or more of the food and more of the supplementation. And when they have more food, they have a more healthy physique. When they have the proper supplementation, they don't develop metabolic bone disease or they develop it at a slower rate than the other gecko. And, you know, a lot of people will only provide one humid hide, one hot hide, one area my frogs, man. <laughs> They're up to no good today. <laughs> They're literally tracking me across the room, like just crawling on the... Anyways, distractions. It's the pet room. They'll often have one gecko that just gets all the things that both geckos need, and that can leave one gecko in a lot worse condition. Also, leopard geckos can be dominant or they can be territorial in the way that like one gecko will lay on top of the other one to make it like submit or to be dominant over it and that gecko often is going to be less likely to thrive because there's literally a bully in its enclosure with it. Now that's one reason why it's dangerous. One gecko 
thrives or just survives and the other one just survives or dies and is often in a lot worse condition than the other. Another reason I think that it's dangerous is because the opportunity for biting and causing bodily harm is there always. People will say, oh, I've had my gecko's house together for years. It's never been a problem. And that may be the truth. Like you might have never had that problem, but that doesn't mean that it's not never going to happen. And in a lot of cases, it does happen either right away or over time. And it can be something as small as like one biting the other one's foot or tail, but that can leave the room for infection, that can leave the room for, um, you know, bleeding or for a toe being completely bitten off or just anything that's not pleasant. You know, like you certainly wouldn't want to live in an environment where another human was causing harm to you. I don't think it's fair to have geckos in an environment where one is causing harm to the other. It can cause things like drop tails. It can cause, like I said, infection. It's just really not nice. And that's if they bite a tail or a foot or like a toe. But there's cases, as this is more the case, I think with like bearded dragons and larger lizards, but there's cases of leopard geckos or reptiles in general biting other reptiles on the face and causing lacerations in the eye, causing blindness, causing damage to the head. Like it's definitely not something that I recommend. And that's one thing people will always say, oh, my leopard geckos have gotten along for years. And while that is probably true, and I'm really happy for that person to not have experienced something as harmful or negative and stressful as a gecko biting another gecko, it's really not worth the risk. The third reason I think that cohabitation is dangerous is because of breeding, and this is wrong for a number of reasons. One, if you have two geckos housed together, a male and a female, that male is going to be constantly trying to breed with the female. Like, people who breed leopard geckos don't even keep them together. They introduce them just so that, you know, procreation can occur, and then they separate them. So when you have a male and a female house together, the male is just constantly pestering her, impregnating her, and she's constantly laying eggs, which is really bad for her body and also for like her health overall. It can reduce her lifespan, it can cause things like um, extreme weight loss, malnutrition, uh, loss of calcium store, metabolic bone disease, follicle stasis, egg binding, all the things that can go along with when a gecko is poorly taken care of and being bred. In fact, I will leave a video about breeding, well, it's not really about breeding, but egg laying and ovulation up there, so you guys can learn more about that. But it's really dangerous when you have a male and a female house together and they're just constantly, you know, breeding. I mean, it's not bad for the male because it's not, he's not producing the eggs, but it's bad for the female. And not only is it bad for her body, but it's incredibly stressful for her to not have like a, a space that's separate from the male so that she's not being pestered nonstop. Another reason this is bad is because you'll be producing leopard geckos and you might have no idea how to incubate the eggs. You might do it wrong. They might come out disabled. They might not live. Um, you might have too many and have no idea what to do with. I just really don't recommend breeding your pet leopard geckos and I'll leave a video about that up here. There's a lot of reasons why it's not a good thing and one of them is just there's already so many pet leopard geckos out there. There's no reason to be producing more, especially if you're going to be keeping your geckos together, they're going to keep producing more and more of them. It's just really not fair. Another reason I think that cohabbing is dangerous is because you don't know which gecko is eating and pooping. Or like imagine if your gecko has a health scare you don't know which gecko it is, if their poop looks weird or if they've vomited or if they're bleeding and like you can't see any obvious injury on them. Like it can be really stressful because you have no idea which gecko is actually the sick one or which gecko is the healthy one. And on top of that, if you are keeping two geckos housed together, unless you are feeding them individually, like by tongs or in their own enclosures or containers for feeding time, you'll have no idea how much food they're actually getting. And this could lead to the problem of one gecko being really unhealthy compared to the other, because not only will they not be getting the food, which is essential for them to live, they also won't be getting the supplements that you put on the food, which are essential for them to live. Cohabbing can also lead to poor behavior in your leopard gecko. It can be reserved or it can be aggressive. Imagine like if you have uh, two leopard geckos and one of them is constantly biting or like being dominant over the other one and you put your hand in there to interact with your gecko that is like the more submissive one. Um, it might think of you as like a danger because in its environment, it's in danger all the time from this other gecko. So in addition to, you know, your inability to interact with the gecko, it itself is going to be in a constant state of like stress. 
So I really don't think it's fair on that level either. Like their behavior will not be the same. In fact, from my own experience and from other people's, if you take Cohab's geckos and you separate them, there might be an initial period where they're like trying to get used to their new enclosure without the other gecko around, but overall their long-term like personality and well-being is going to be better in my opinion and from what I have seen others experience than if you keep two geckos cohabbed. The thing I want to address that I meant to do at the beginning but we're here now so we're going to address it now is that people will say cohabitating leopard geckos is that was my white street frogs is natural because in nature they interact with each other and I understand that perspective however the vast majority of people who keep leopard geckos are not going to be recreating their native or wild habitat in order to facilitate what would need to be in place to have a successful time keeping multiple leopard geckos together. For example, someone who wants to keep multiple geckos together will need to have like a zoo grade exhibit, a really large enclosure, tons of hiding spaces, proper heat gradient. Like you'll want to, instead of just having like an under tank heater, you'll want to have heat from above that creates multiple basking spots so that they can come out and bask. You'll even maybe want to have multiple basking spots, like one on each end and then a cooler spot in the middle. But you'll need to have a lot like you'll need to have multiple humid hides you'll need to feed them individually to make sure they're all getting food you'll need to make sure you have the right amount of geckos and the right sexes so like you don't want to have a bunch of males and one female you'll need to have like a lot of females and a male and in this situation you'll end up with a lot of babies so you could have a lot of females and no males but you can't have all males together essentially if you're going to do it i'll give you all the ways in which you could make it the safest in my opinion the risk of bite infection or like improper behavior is all still going to be there so i still don't recommend it personally for keeping them like as a pet but again there are going to be some people who have like large enough enclosures and um, proper husbandry and the right amount of geckos and the right sex of geckos that everything will go well for a long long time so i don't want to discount that possibility but for the vast majority of keepers, that is not something that's going to be happening. Like most people are not looking to do that. So I don't recommend it, but here's some things I recommend that you do do if you are looking to keep them together. Number one, you need to have a massive enclosure. Now, currently the minimum that I recommend for a leopard gecko is 30 to 40 gallons. So if you're going to have two geckos housed together, I recommend like 75 to 80 gallons. And in order to properly heat this enclosure, you're going to want to have multiple hot spots, probably from above, like a deep heat projector or like a, a basking bulb, like a halogen. You'll want to make sure that they can properly move between these spaces so that they don't feel oh gosh i have to stay in this little corner over here because that gecko is going to torment me so having a lot of space really helps with that and not just space you don't just want like a big empty tank you're going to need a space that has a lot of hides if you're going to go the route of cohabbing i really recommend doing like a diy background or and sides with like built-in caves and built-in areas for them to interact and hide or you can even do like a flat background that they can climb and just cover the place in hides and cork rounds and things like that so they can do a lot of climbing and a lot of hiding away from one another i also recommend feeding them separately because then you'll be able to know how much food each of your geckos is getting. I recommend cohabiting females, not males, and not males and females. So I don't recommend cohabitating males because males will be aggressive towards one another and are more likely to have negative interactions. I don't recommend cohabitating a male and a female or multiple females and a male because you'll end up with tons of babies. And also I think that raises the chance for things to go wrong because the male will constantly be trying to breed with them and also the chance for things like follicle stasis, egg binding, or just improper health because of poor supplementation or just not, you know, getting enough nutrients because they're constantly putting out eggs, it raises the risks. So in my opinion, if you're going to cohab, keep females and please know how to sex leopard geckos before you put them together. Make sure that you have girls and when you put them together, there's not a single boy in there. If you have leopard geckos cohabbed, you're going to want to pay 
extra, extra close attention to their health. It'd be a really good idea to have like a chart off to the side where like once a month you write down their weights, you write down their eating habits when they eat, you write down what their poops look like and you can try and figure out, because the cool thing about leopard geckos is they'll poop in the same place every time. So maybe you can watch your gecko and see where each one poops and then you can kind of keep an eye on who's doing what. But you'll want to make sure you have routine vet checkups. Like you want to make sure you are on top of what you're doing if you have them housed together. Another thing you're going to want to do is make sure that you have an immediate setup that you have like as a backup. So you'll need to have like, I don't know, a, a 10 or 20 gallon spare enclosure that you can use for like a quarantine or a med setup in case a bite occurs because you're going to want that gecko to be able to heal properly and make sure that no infection sets in, that sort of thing. So I really recommend having a spare setup in case something goes wrong because that's something a lot of people don't do. They'll go out and they'll buy one setup, put two geckos together and not have any backup situation when a lot of times, unfortunately, a backup is needed. Those are my opinions about cohabitating leopard geckos. <laughs> my white tree frogs, man. <laughs> so distracting. Let me know your thoughts down below about cohabitation. How do you feel? Do you think it's okay to cohab geckos? Have you ever tried it before? Will you ever try it? And again, please remember my bottom line answer is cohab for 99% of people and leopard geckos is not a good idea. I hope that I've provided much explanation for why I feel that way in this video. So thank you for watching. I hope you found this informational and insightful. If you did, let me know by leaving a like and a comment. Also, please consider subscribing, hitting the notification bell. Also, please consider supporting us on Patreon or by becoming a channel member. We'd love to have you. And with that said, I will see you guys in the next one. Bye!